this is a quote that came from Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, just prior to last general, or when he addressed the Berger's Conference in Atlanta in 2018. Uh, and I love it so much. The, Berger, the ministry of the Berger is to help lead the church in bearing witness in the world to the hospitality of God by preparing the church to be a truly hospitable place by helping us to worship the Lord our God in dignity in order, in beauty, and in truth in the church so that we can go forth into the world to witness to that, to witness to that God, to witness that God to the world. Um, and I love it. And I think that's what we're all about. Uh, basically, we're going to talk about a number of things, but let's start off knowing that this is a servant ministry. Um, and who do we work for? We work for our priests. We are not in charge. They are. Um, I get a lot of questions <clears throat> asked about, about Sunday morning dynamics. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, as vergers, especially those that have been through the training course or those that have been around the church for a while, we got a lot of answers. Um, we know how to do a lot. When we see the altar frontal is not the correct color, we may have served on the, the altar guild before or, uh, or whatever. We, I know we can go find the altar right thing and do it. But I ask you to please remember that there are people in your congregation who, who want to do ministry and have signed up to do ministry. And as well as we can do things as, as the verger, we need to allow them to do their ministry. Um, I know when I moved into the national, when I got into the national cathedral, that was the hardest lesson for me to learn. Um, uh, uh, Rob Bolter, the uh, priest associate for Berger for ministry at the cathedral, pulled me aside and Garnier took a two by four to my head. He said, do let people do their ministry. Uh, so while I can change the frontal, if, if I notice it wrong, I'm going to go find an altar guild me member and ask if I can help. Um, uh, if the, you know, yeah, I think you know what I mean. Uh, the various different ministries uh, that take place on a Sunday morning. You know, uh, I'm not going to jump in and hand out leaflets. I'm not going to jump in and, and uh, if I'm missing a limb, uh, yes, I can take a chalice uh, and a pinch. I would, uh, but if I can find another lamb, I'm going to go find and so find a sub. Uh, so I think it's important from a dynamics on Sunday morning uh, that we respect the ministry of others. Um, uh, I think that covers the two also. Uh, the last item on this slide, I am adamant. There was a a long time custom of the Berger's Guild uh, that because we work for our rector, when our rector leaves, when our rector leaves, we uh, immediately turn in our resignation, or when the new, new rector arrives, uh, we hand in our letter of resignation. We work for the prior rector, uh, therefore, we hand them our resignation and pray that they're going to accept us and ask us not to and ask us to stay on. We've got to stop doing that, folks. Um, when a new rector arrives, imagine you were the new rector arriving. Okay? And the second day in the door, you get a lineup outside your door of all the main, all the people that have major leaders throughout your congregation have showed up with letters of resignation hoping to get reassigned or re rehired, but they all showed up with it. Uh, if you were the new rector, you'd go ballistic. You'd, you'd freak out. You'd probably resign yourself. Um, so we need, to, we need to get that out of our head that we do not need to resign when a new clergy comes. We need to go talk to that person and you know, tell them what we've been doing and how we can help them and ask them if we can stay on. Uh, and how can, how can we help them in their ministry? 
Duke. Yes. How did that start in the first place and how long ago was that started? I know that when I was a kid, my father was a priest, um, Episcopal priest. And I know that when it was, it was a fact, it, it happened back then that people resigned when a new rector showed up. Uh, parish secretaries resigned when a new, back then when a new rector showed up. And with the hope of the rector saying, I, I, okay, but I'd like you to stay on. Um, so it's been around for years and years and years and years. Uh, but the person that probably has the most institutional knowledge of how that parish has functioned and how that new clergy can, can best assimilate into is you. Uh, but Duke. Yes. I have a question. Who is this? Kay Davis. Yeah, hi. If I am serving the Lord, why would I resign? I am serving the Lord. It happens that you also happen to be serving the Lord too. And it's nice if we can work together, <laughs> but we are serving the Lord. And so therefore, it behooves us <laughs> to work together because we are in community serving the Lord. So sure. I'm unclear how this whole thing got started in the first place and why it would continue since we are serving the Lord. Work as unto the Lord. I, I understand. And I, and I agree with you. But the reason it probably got started, okay. by canon law, the priest is in charge. They are, it is their congregation. And I, I you know, I was not one of the ones that, that did it at the time. Uh, but it has always been kind of an unwritten custom that, that you resign and then hopefully got rehired as a symbol of you used to work for the prior clergy. Now you work for the new rector. Symbolic. And I'm telling you that that doesn't need to happen anymore. You do need to go talk to your director. But, yeah, is that is that? Are you saying it need not happen anymore because we have finally figured out that we're serving the war, <laughs> or is there another reason that? Because I'm serving the Lord. So is there? What happens if you if you want to continue serving the Lord as the verger and the ver and, 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 and the rector says I'd like you to step down? That priest is in charge. No, no, I'm not questioning what you're saying. What I'm questioning is what is generating it. In other <clears throat> words, if what is generating it is that we are serving the Lord, and we will do everything possible to work together to serve the Lord, then. Yeah, and, and, and I will take that as a, as a, uh, a 21st century type of, of acknowledgement of our ministry, of our, of our ministries and all ministries within the church. But the old custom, whether we do or agree with it or not, the old custom was uh, if you had an assistant <laughs> rector, that assistant rector would, would, would resign when the new clergy got there. Um, and then the new clergy would, would then hire them back. And it was just, a, a, it was an old custom uh, that is, it is gone, but that is, needs to go by the wayside. <laughs> I wonder if it was seen as a mark of courtesy, um, but it's not, but it's a courtesy that's um, wasteful and un, unuseful now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. May I say something? This sure. is Kathy. Um, I was in training um, when we got a new priest in charge. She saw no reason for there to be a verger at all. And yeah. so my training stopped. I've heard of that, Kathy. Yeah, she has moved on very recently, which is why I am attending this conference. And I hope that when we get, to get a new interim, 
I will be allowed to complete training. Wow. Let me tell you that we have 35 years ago, 30, this is 33rd annual conference, so 33 years ago, vergers in the Episcopal Church, there were only a handful. Um, most of them, in, the majority of them were in cathedrals, but the handful that were out in, in congregations gave the vergers guild a bad name. <laughs> Because they came in with, uh, I'm the verger. I know how to do everything. Uh, let me tell you how it's going to be done. And the priest's reaction to that is, huh, no, you're not in charge. And if that's your attitude, get out of here. Um, we have worked diligently uh, over the last 20 years or more to change that perspective. Uh, and I think we're making... The, I know we're making it, we're turning that corner. Uh, there are uh, over 2,000 active vergers of the Vergers Guild. Um, there are probably 6,000 vergers out there in the country. Uh, and we have turned that corner um, uh, with those that have worked with one. Um, because we no longer take that I, I'm in charge type of mentality. There are still some, some, some of the older clergy that are still reluctant to have a verger. Um, uh, and it can be a, a, a dance to figure out with, with someone like that, how, uh, how can I express my, how my ministry can be a benefit to them. Uh, and it, it's, it's a hard nut to crack. And Kathy, I feel sorry for you with that interim that came in, uh, and I pray that, that that everything works out in the future. Thank you. I'm hoping so too. Thank you also for giving the history behind it, because now that makes it easier to understand. Uh, a lot of our responsibilities. Um, that first bullet statement there, uh, typically when, it, when we're out uh, on a Sunday morning, the verger's in front of the cross uh, on, on the procession in. But we are not leading the procession. We are escorting. That's a big difference. In the Episcopal Church, crosses lead procession. Uh, the historic position of the verger was uh, in Church of England, where they'd all, where the priests would gather at a church, take a verger, and the verger would lead a, would escort a procession through. In that case, he was probably leading it, uh, but would escort a procession through the town, carrying a stick, knocking dogs, <laughs> cats, kids, drunks, whatever, out of the way, uh, to make room for that that procession to go around and gather people and bring them back to church. Um, but when we es we we escort, and I I, I realize escorting and leading is probably fine line between the two, but, the, but we need to understand that we are escorting. Uh, many of our vergers serve as sacristans. Uh, as a matter of fact, the prior president of the guild, uh, Scott Smith, uh, uh, is at Trinity Wall Street, and his title is sacristan. He's not a verger, but he's in charge of the group. We often serve as acolyte masters, uh, serve in the altar guild. A lot of us are audiovisual techs, especially now that we're in pandemics. Uh, so, sometimes we swing the swing the thurible, um, uh, and many serve on vestries or, or as wardens in their church. So, uh, uh, behind the scenes types of things, uh, uh, many of us uh, help with worship planning. Uh, uh, I do a lot of Eucharistic minister training. Um, I schedule vergers, lems, lectors. I don't do acolytes. Uh, my acolyte master does. Um, and then other duties as assigned. And I've been a, a verger in all three of those, mission, parish, and cathedral. Uh, and jobs vary. What the, the other duties as assigned vary. Um, when I was in a mission church, 
Uh, I actually played guitar in the choir. Uh, and only vested as a verger uh, two times a year, lead a procession or escort a procession. Uh, at the parish level, it's a big, and we won't even talk about what it is like to be in the cathedral. Uh, that was a nightmare. I worked 80 hours a week, 70 hours a week. Uh, have, have all of you recognized most of the names? You all have a training course. I probably don't need to go into much about the training course. Uh, if you don't I have not have, had a training course. Pardon? I have not had a training course. Okay. Um, the training course is available through our website, through the Guild Shop. Uh, it does run $65. Um, if you're, if you elect, there's no requirement, no requirement for a verger to complete the training course to be a verger. You are a verger when your rector or your priest says you're a verger. Okay. Um, the training course will probably make you a more a better verger and a more knowledgeable verger, uh, and probably more help to your rector. But that's not a requirement. Um, currently, there's about 650 vergers that have completed the training course out of the two or 3,000 that are in the guild. Uh, it's not a requirement. But if you do take, take the course, um, we will, I, when, you, when you register for the course, uh, you t I turn around and send your, your, your clergy a complimentary copy of the course because they serve as your mentor uh, through the course. Um, course runs $65. Uh, you'll gain knowledge about the, a lot of these books. You don't need to go out and buy them. You don't need a book. You don't need the altar book, the gospel book, occasional services, priest handbooks. Um, all these things are available in print and online. Um, but your, your rector has them all. Uh, you don't need to run out and buy them, but you'll study uh, these various different books that we use on daily, on a Sunday basis. Purchasing the course does not mean you're in the course. Um, page 10 of the course is an enrollment form. When you, uh, just like you can go to a college bookstore and buy a, a textbook, that doesn't put you in a college class. Um, you need to fill out the enrollment form so that I can send your clergy mentor um, a, a complimentary copy. Uh, a lot of group, some parishes, uh, the, the course does lend itself for group training. Uh, if you've got three or four vergers going through the course at the same time, uh, I've had priests that meet with them once a week or once every two weeks and they cover a section. Um, so it does lend itself for group vetting or, or group, group training. How many of you serve as a verger in a lone parish or, or by yourself? Many, a couple of you. Kathy does. Um, sort of. I've, there, there's another one in my parish. Okay. Um, you know, I have in my current church. I have four. Um, when I was at the National Cathedral, I had twelve. Um, before I went to the National Cathedral, I was in the congregation that I'm back at now after I retired from the cathedral, um, and I was the only virgin. I was the first virgin they ever had. Um, Duke, how big is your current church? Uh, uh, average Sunday attendance pre-COVID was about 350. Uh, uh, the National Cathedral, about 1,500 on, on average Sunday, uh, and about 3,300 at Christmas and Easter services at each one. Uh, but... Uh, I talk about uh, expanding our ministry, A, uh, uh, it helps to avoid burnout. If you're the only verger and you're serving every single Sunday, every single service, and then a wedding and maybe a funeral in between, uh, and you're doing this on a volunteer basis, it can cause burnout. Uh, and we all know jobs can cause burnout, anything can cause it, but serving by yourself in that capacity, as much as we love it, uh, as a period of time, there's a good chance you're going to burn out. 
How many vergers is too many vergers to have on staff? It depends on each church. For us here in, in, in Round Rock, um, four is plenty. Uh, we serve as the head verger, the lead verger, um, one, I mean, once every four weeks. Um, and then uh, in between that, uh, we pop our heads in and see if we can be of help. Um, but it avoids burnout. Um, and you may be asked if, if that's the case to help select new vergers at some time. Uh, and I will remind, I was asked that question. Um, <coughs> When I got to national, I mean, my interview for the national cathedral job, about how do you how do you select a new verger? Um, and my answer to that, and the one I stick with, is there are three types of people that gravitate towards the verger's ministry. There are those that want it for power, those that want it for glory, and those that truly understand what a ministry of service is all about. And you got to guard against the first two while you look for the third. And it can be rough. And I mentioned that at a, at a, a clergy conference once. And the answer to that then was, yeah, we got a lot of clergy in that same boat. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Amen. Uh, how many of you serve as acolyte masters? Any of you? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet? Um, I think we need one. <laughs> yeah. We just lost uh, one that we'd had for a long time, and nobody's uh, so far talking about replacement, but I, I think it's an important um, important thing to do. So yeah, quite I often, imagine that's going to become me. <laughs> yeah, quite often a verger steps into that role. Um, at the parish I'm at now, I've got one of my assistants, uh, one of the the other volunteers is, is in that role. Um, uh, it's a natural for a verger to be in that role as the acolyte master. Um, uh, and how it handles within your parish is unique to your parish. Um, you know, things you'll cover uh, your, that I cover in acolyte training, uh, lighting candles. You light them from the inside out or the outside in. Oh, we always did it from the outside in. I can give you a reason for both. <laughs> if you light them from the outside in, you are focusing in on the cross to open the to begin the service, and you put them out from the inside out, signifying we're going out into the going out and carrying our Christianity out into the world. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, other people say you light them from the inside out. Because you're opening the book to begin the service. And you put them out from the outside in because you're closing the book because the service is over. Uh, as long as you do it with dignity, it doesn't make any difference. Um, do you light the gospel candle, the gospel side or the epistle side candle first? The epistle huh? side first. The, epistle the, old, side. the old custom in the Episcopal Church is was you always like the epistle side first for the gospel, and you always put out the gospel side before you put out the epistle side. Mm -hmm. and the theology behind that was the gospel should never be left standing alone. Hmm. I, I, I worked, I learned to be an acolyte from my father when I was sixth grade, fifth grade, something like that. And his philosophy was, you light the gospel candle first and you put it out last because the gospel is the only thing that can stand alone in this world. Mm -hmm. I like his theology, so I do it that way. But you know what? It's not It's not a biggie. Uh, the solution is send two acolytes up and light them simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> and what if you have an ambo and there is only one place from which everything is proclaimed? Make it up on the fly. The gospel side, epistle side are the two that are sitting on the altar. Even if you've got an ambo where they preach from, they not have an altar. Um, usually you have two Eucharistic candles sitting on the altar. You may not. Um, but you know, as long as 
whatever you do, as long as you do it with dignity, um, uh, what difference does it make? Uh, if the uh, gray-haired old lady in the, in the, with the with the hat on in the second row, who's been there in that same seat for 75 years, uh, uh, says you're doing it wrong, That's right. uh, listen to her, but don't argue with her. <laughs> If you're thinking about being an, an act by master and you're serving, I'll tell you, there is a new book that just came out um, called I Serve at God's Altar. Um, you can see the little picture on the side. Uh, we won't show. Uh, just came out from church publishing called I Serve at God's Altar, the Ministry of Acolytes. Um, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it runs about $12, $13. Uh, it's about less than a half inch thick. Um, I did a pre-read on it before they published it. And they, I even gave them a, uh, an acknowledgement on the back page. Um, the nice thing about this book is it's not written for the acolyte. It's written for the acolyte master. It's in a perspective of how do you teach acolytes? What can you do? Uh, with the acolyte for uh, this sort of thing. It, it's got a couple of mistakes. I tried to correct them. They went to publishing before I got them corrected. They showed the verger behind the cross instead of, instead of escorting. You know, that's no big, no big deal. But I highly recommend that book, I Serve at God's Altar, the Ministry of Acolytes uh, from Church Publishing. Uh, been out about, about two years, now, uh, but it's a good book. Vestments. Some vergers don't wear vestments. Some do. Most of the ones that aren't doing vestments are doing the behind the scenes work um, that needs to be done. Um, if you do, uh, the typical routine is cassocks and shamir. Um, but as you'll see in a few pictures I got coming up, um, a number of them were cassock and surplus. In morning prayer, evening prayer, even song, uh, hoods and tippets uh, can be worn. Remember a tippet, while you normally see a tippet on clergy, while you normally see a, uh, while you normally see a tippet on clergy, um, it can be worn by a layperson. It's not a it's not a, a sacramental vestment, but it, uh, but a tippet can be worn by lay people. Um, I'm going to ask you if you wear a hood. You'll see a lot of choir members wearing hoods. If you're in cassock and surplus, a hood looks okay. But a cassock and a shamir, to me, a hood looks wrong. Uh, that's my preference. And if you've read the, the training course line um, that, that says, as far as vestments go, uh, uh, less is less and less is enough. <laughs> uh, you'll see preaching tabs, jabots, ruffs, and hats, and I've drawn a line for them, through them. Uh, they draw attention to us. Mm -hmm. They don't help us do our job. Our job is to be, you know, when, when, in the middle of a service, if I run out and run into the sacristy, uh, it's not a, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's he doing? It's a, uh, oh, there's a verger taking care of something. Uh, if I step out to go adjust the microphone volume. Um, and it, if you get in the point where you're not drawing attention to yourself, why put on preaching tabs, bows and roughs? Me, they're just attention drawers. Here are some typical vestments with a uh, cassock. Now, it's purple because it was taken from a cathedral verger. Uh, and this is the the shamir, the shamir that we sell through the guild shop. Um, uh, you will find uh, this is an old style picture. I actually have one of these robes uh, with the stripes on it. Um, Norny wore it over a business suit. Um, 
I've got one, but not many people wear this. Most of them are this. This is preaching tabs. This is a Jabot. This are roughs. Cathedral choristers usually wear them. And this is those infernal Berger's hats. <laughs> I detest. Uh, I had one at the National Cathedral. It stayed in its box. And I inherited it from the, from the guy, my predecessor, and I passed it on to the guy leading it coming after. This was pictures and pictures taken from the 2010 Berger's Conference at the National Cathedral. And you'll see anywhere from uh, a friend of mine uh, from my church uh, wearing the, the Sir Placassic and Shamir uh, from the Berger's Guild. Uh, this is Theopolis wearing his white one. Um, Some of those, but you can see the variety of different vestments, um, you know, complete variety of vestments uh, as they process in. Uh, uh, that was taken at the high altar. Everybody was there. Uh, you see my cathedral vergers are, are, are just in a cascus and shamir. But there's a whole variety of everything. So what you decide to do is your business until you discuss it with your rector. Those are cassock, cast socks. And I ordered too many cassocks. Now I have a surplus. Sorry, bad humor. How much could you do? How many of you have a beetle pole? Any of you? You know what a beetle pole is? No. <laughs> I have one, actually. You do? I do. Oh. Yeah. It, but typically, a verge is about. 33 to 36 inches long. The beetle poles, it's about five foot, maybe six foot. How long is yours, Courtney? It's about um, five, five and a half feet. Okay. It's um, from the 18th century. Wow. Nice. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start. Next Sunday, take, send a photo of it to me. I'd love to see it. Sure. If you want to put me up on the screen, I can show everybody right now. Uh, <laughs> we can see you. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh. it's, wow. it's, it's oh, wow. long. Very long. Long. <laughs> long. <laughs> long. <laughs> long. <laughs> yeah. Um. There is a difference, long versus short. Um, is there a difference on what is the top? What is on top of it? The uh, well, you know, the, the finial at the top varies by, by whoever made it. Oh, okay. There you go. There's mine. It's a brass yeah. ball. Big brass ball. I've seen them with, uh, with, with cathedral emblems on the top. Uh, uh, I've seen them with all sorts of things. Uh, the, the finial on the top is your, is whatever you put on one. Uh, the difference between the two uh, is in how you carry it and when you carry it. Okay. Um, the easiest answer, the, the, the easiest of those two is the when. Uh, you carry a verge or you carry a beetle pole when you are escorting something, somebody or something. Okay. Uh, if you're a verger, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll be a verger that's just in procession because I need an extra version of the altar or something, and you're not actually leading, escorting somebody or something. You don't carry a verge unless you're escorting. If you go back to these pictures at the National Cathedral, back there, you'll see none of these verges are carrying, carrying a verge. None of them. Uh, and that's because the verge is being carried by the verger that's escorting that procession. So you only carry one if you're if you're actually using it. It's a symbol of office if you're if you're doing something. Verges, how do you carry them? How many have seen the National Cathedral vergers in, in procession somewhere? I have. They carry their verge in their hand out at a 45 degree <laughs> angle in front of them. Okay. Uh, or sorry, they 
that's how the normal bird is. National Cathedral carries it on their shoulder. Okay. There's a reason they carry it on their shoulder. The National Cathedral is a tenth of a mile long. If you get a verge with a heavy ball on the end of it or something, and you hold that at a 45 degree angle in front of you as you're walking, by the time you get to the altar, you're going to have to put a, a, a brace on your wrist um, if it doesn't collapse. Um, because the verges there are heavy and the distance is long, the custom has been to put it on your shoulder. If you want to adopt that, that's fine. The typical verge is carried at a 45 degree angle in front of you when you're leading somebody. Uh, and when you're not leading somebody, uh, you kind of cradle it across your chest or drop it, to, drop it to the floor. Is that 45 degrees on the axis of your body or yes. is that 45 degrees on the axis of the verge? 45 degrees on the axis of your body. Thank you. Okay, so you're carrying it out in front. So it's still upright, but it's away from your body. Correct. Okay. Uh, when you're leading, and when not, bring it, bring it back in. Now, a beetle pole on the con uh, is, is different. Uh, I happen to know of a congregation that carries a beetle pole, propped out 45 degrees in front of them, uh, and they're gonna and the back end is sitting two feet behind them, <clears throat> and they're gonna whack somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> you're going to. Traditional carry of a beetle pole is on your shoulder with beetle, the end of the beetle pole about three or four inches above the ground. And when you're leading somebody, you angle the bottom out about 15 to 20 degrees. Okay, but it's still sitting on your shoulder. That way you're not killing anybody. <laughs> you kind of use it almost like a peeler stick as you're walking. Dude. Yeah. Could you go over again uh, when you carry the bird? Well, actually, when you carry the beetle pole. A beetle pole is interchangeable with a bird. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, it's interchangeable. I will say probably 95% of the vergers in the country carry a bird. Yeah. Five, five to six percent carry a beetle pole. Um, and they're both acceptable. And they're both interchangeable. Thank you. Uh, here's some examples. There's your 45 degree angle. Um, this is the current uh, uh, fellow's verge uh, with the spiral shaft and the verger's emblem on the top. Um, this is pretty much the standard, the, the normal, the, the verge that uh, the non-fellows birds that we carry in the, in the shop is this one you know, with a cross on the top of it. And these are just other examples. These are some of Whipple's uh, that are available. Uh, this little dude here, that thing gets heavy. Carried at 45 degrees. But, uh, you know, and you can, you can purchase a verge. Uh, my first verge was a, was a table leg uh, with a cross from a Went down to a flag shop and bought a, uh, a cross from the top finial from the top of a flagpole, like a church flagpole, stuck it on the end of it. That was my first bird. Uh, so they come and go at all times. They're all, all types. These uh, are some of the books I use on a regular basis. Um, you don't need to purchase them. Your priest probably has them. But they are available uh, both in print and in Amazon and Kindle. Probably this is the handiest one, Priest Handbook. <coughs> and then, secondly, this Lent, Holy Week, Easter, and the Great 50 Days, a phenomenal uh, way through Holy Week, Lent. Uh, they're just great resources, the four most common, four biggest resources that I use. These are listed on the uh, in the um, training guide somewhere, aren't they? Yes, they are on the back page. The next back page. Thank you. Resources. They're listed there. Also, this slideshow will be up on the on the on the website uh, okay. under this conference uh, shortly sure. after the conference, so you can go to it and find it there. Mm -hmm. So.
we're down to the anecdote and question. Uh, before we wrap this up, we got about 15, 20 minutes. I have a quick question. Um, sure. We were having, uh, we're getting ready for the consecration of our new bishop. And we were having a discussion and, and me being a beginner verger, I couldn't answer the question, but there was a question about how many crosses you can carry in a procession, because some people believed that you could only carry one and other people believed you could carry as many as you wanted. The answer I would give what? depends on who and what you're doing. Um, a, at the National Cathedral, at my current parish, we use one cross and torch. Uh, at the National Cathedral, we use two every Sunday. Uh, one at the beginning one, and one at the end? No, we had one uh, at the beginning uh, and then one right before the altar party. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. That was our distinction between the two. Um, uh, if you're doing a consecration of a bishop, depending on the space you may be in. If you follow the customary that comes out from, uh, from uh, yeah, it was uh, 15, or something, yeah. you'll find that there are three processional lines. Yeah. Okay. And you need to cross and torch in front of each one. Yeah, okay. At a minimum. Uh, if I, I've done one, two, three, four consecrations, uh, three at the National Cathedral and one here in, in Texas. Um, uh, and I use four sets of cross and torches. In that I put one at the head of each one of those processional lines, uh, and then one uh, in front of the platform party, the, the, all the bishops mm -hmm. that are going up on the party. That was that was what I would use. Okay. okay. Um, uh, but any any procession that's got a separate procession definitely needs one, uh, and in, in that customary you have three different processions. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you haven't seen that, those that haven't seen that customary, it's about nineteen pages long. Yeah, I'm about halfway through it. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I've done a number of them. If you need to call me on a, on a separate time, Christine, go ahead and do that. I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, I'll give you any help I can. Um, I got I got to tell my favorite anecdote though, uh, and this one did happen at the National Cathedral. Uh, there, in the middle of a certain, when you come time to communion up there, um, uh, the vergers. Are the ones that help set the table, not the acolytes. Um, Berger brings in the stack and sets it on the altar and walks off. Um, uh, the, acoly the acolytes do bring in the wine and that kind of thing and set them on the table. But then a verger brings the lavabo bowl in. Okay. And my assistant one morning, we had a brand new, recently seminary graduate female clergy, delightful young lady. Um, her first time serving uh, as the presider uh, at a service. And my assistant grabbed the pitcher, grabbed the lavabo bowl, and there's a fine, up there, there's a fine distinction between the water pitcher and the reserve communion, reserve wine pitcher. Mm. He grabbed the wrong one. Mm. And he went up to her, she, and there she was. There they do the the priest is usually still seated, and they bring the lavabo bowl up. And he put the bowl under her hand. And he poured that pitcher and poured the wine over her fingers, mm -hmm. and in, as if he practiced it, it, it just he looked her square in the eyes and said, "How'd you do that?" Ellen, you know those people. That was that was yeah. Stanley Utterback and Wendy Tobias. Okay. <laughs> Dude, well, I have to thank you just truly uh, for your willingness to be there as I've gone through this training thing. I'm still going through it, but also just your wisdom. But but your willingness just has been a large boon. I I set out pre-COVID to get this done by a certain time and then COVID hit. <laughs> and uh, so my priest and I went, okay, this is not getting finished at this time. But but your 
being there just made the difference. I was like, oh, oh, oh. now I had been a verger for a good seven years before I got the training thing. Uh, simply because my dean, when I became a verger, said, no, don't do that. But now I could, so it's like, oh, okay, okay. And so I was grossly disappointed when I couldn't finish when I thought I should. And I just have got to thank you um, for being there and just ameliorating all of that frustration and anxiety. Well, but also you're just support of, of us. Just you're well, I, not. I thank you for that. I, I do it because it's a labor of love. I love the Episcopal Church. Um, and I love, I love the ministry that I do. Uh, and if, if I love it that much, then, then I feel it's my responsibility to help other people love it. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, so I never got to finish the training, but I got most of it done. I got into the safety stuff and being a retired teacher, I'm like, okay, guys, so where is our active shooter drill? Where mm -hmm. is our this? Where is our that? You know, you I'm trouble, didn't you? Huh? You got in trouble for asking too many questions, didn't you? Well, um, I didn't get a whole lot of cooperation, and then yeah. things started changing, and you know, people it, it got tabled because there were more important matters. Am I just driving myself crazy, and I should just like not worry about all of the those things and just stick to the altar? Um, sorry, my wife in here, right? That's, that's Diane behind me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, they are important. They're important functions. They're important things that need to be done at some point. I would not, it, to me, it's not the hill I'd want to die on. It's not the battle uh, that I that I would have, that I would strive to take on before something else. Um, keep in mind you're doing you're doing the course with your clergy as the mentor, uh, and if you two have had a discussion about uh, about these things and and they, they don't want to pursue it or they don't want to keep it going uh, or do something about it, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it something that that that, that it was imperative. I can tell you in the Diocese of Texas, uh, we've got some pretty strict rules about uh, about active shooter. Um, uh, and our bishop has declared that, that uh, unless you are a, uh, a licensed police officer uh, hired by the church for security, you will not carry a firearm on your property, period. Yeah, and that's not, I mean, I'm talking more about like, if somebody walks in the doors. Yep. You know, that's, that's, that's my concern, because that was the concern as a teacher. And, I understand. As a school district. Uh, I understand. And if you have the conversation with your, with your clergy, and they're not, they're not real fired up about doing it, at least you started, you planted the seed. Okay. That it's something you need to be working on. Okay. Thank you. And your and your local police department is um, really a great source for the information on that. You don't have to come up. You don't have to invent the wheel yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I started those phone calls before things got shut down. Stop sharing so I can see everybody. Hey, Danny. What are you doing in this, this, this one? You're an old timer. I just hadn't hit the first button that popped up. <laughs> yeah, he's been a member of the guild longer than I have, actually. Uh, Checking on us. Yep. How did you get to how did you get to the cathedral and how did you get from the cathedral? I'm talking about the national cathedral. Yeah. Uh, when my predecessor up there uh, decided he was going to retire, there was an ad placed in the Living Church magazine for New Head Verger and its responsibilities. 
and uh, my priest said, "You must, um, you must apply." And here I am sitting in the sticks in West Texas, mid Central Texas. Uh, in no way in hell is anybody even going to talk to me. Uh, and lo and behold, I got a, a, a phone interview because I put in my resume and put, I got a phone interview. And then about a month later, I got a second interview with a stack of clergy. Um, and then I got asked to come up for an in-person interview. Um, and uh, I told them that if I was coming up for an interview on a Friday or Saturday, uh, that I would like to stay and see Sunday morning worship, see what the vergers are doing, see if it's what I really want to do. Um, they put me up on a Saturday. Uh, I had a walk around, look, see on Sunday, uh, and uh, Monday I had an interview with the dean, uh, and a month later they call, I, I went home and said, eh, I'm done, uh, uh, and lo and behold, I got a phone call, uh, and I asked again, asked to come up and be their new head verger. I was there for seven years, uh, and it was time to retire. And uh, while I love it, loved it, and I love it still, and I, I miss not being there. Um, uh, I don't miss the 70 hour work weeks. Um, I don't miss the commute I had to take on a Sunday on a daily basis to get in. I live 12 miles from the cathedral, it took me an hour and a half to drive in. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I miss it, but I'm also happy to be retired. And I got 21 grandchildren, and I have more fun playing with grandkids than I do uh, serving in the National Cathedral. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to, if there's no more questions, I'm going to wrap this up uh, and uh, head back into the main room before we dismiss it so that I can get things set for the next session. So uh, I will see you all later. Thank you very much. I will get Thank these you. slides posted. If you, you'll, you'll find them in a couple of days. If you go to the back to our vergers.org website, click on the 2021 conference, uh, they'll be at the bottom. There'll be a link. Thank you. Duke, thank you. Before, before you repost them, a couple of times you have dynamics misspelled on the slides. On, on your name or? No. The word this dynamics. Is, the word oh, dynamics. Did I misspell a word? Yeah, it, oh, on several different slides. How many school teachers I got out there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Spelling is not my strong suit. I usually rely on spell check. I wonder how that one missed it. Um, okay, I'll fix that. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. I'll see you back in the main room. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>